Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to Voices from the Bench, episode 128. My name is Elvis. And my name is Barbara. How's everybody doing out there? It's Labor Day weekend for us. I know this goes out Monday, but... It's Friday, so I'm excited. Yeah, I hear you. I hope when this episode goes out, nobody's actually working, but you know in our industry, there's probably a few people at the lab. (laughs) Yeah. So, hey, I think you sent me a text that we had our biggest month ever last month. Yeah. Biggest downloads. Yep. So we were pretty busy last month with people listening to the podcast, and not only just the newest episodes, some of the older episodes were getting a lot of downloads. So that's exciting. Fantastic. Word is spreading, and I think people are getting back into their routine of the pandemic being, you know, not over by any means, but they're getting back into working again, and life is getting back to, you know, listening to us at the bench or exercising or driving, because for a while, nobody was doing that, so it is great. Well, congratulations. I just wanted to acknowledge that. Well done, partner. Absolutely. And also, we did insert a little blurb last week about... LMT Lab Day Chicago moving to May next year. Yay! Yeah. Super happy about that. So happy, Judy. Got that news out and decided to move to May and the Hyatt's working with her. I really, really am glad that meeting's going to go on. Yeah, so even though it's going from February to May... I'm going to ask now officially that lab technicians still wear closed toe shoes. I don't want to see a bunch of flip flops uh, <laughs> down in the vendor yeah. area. Midwinter. Now it's, set. oh, I can't wait. May is going to be beautiful in Chicago. We can go running along the water. It's going to be sunny, hopefully. I can't wait. I'm stoked. Yeah, they should move some of it outdoors. That'd be fun. Yeah, I don't fantastic. know if that's possible, but that would be fun. Yeah. So yeah, looking forward to that. Of course, you know, everything either got canceled or pushed back, but it's good news that the biggest show in the country of the yeah. year is still happening just a little later than usual. Yep. I'm clapping on my side, partner. I cannot wait. Way to go, <laughs> Judy, and thank you. We're super happy with that. Thank you for not making it just a virtual conference. Yeah. I mean, we they do don't. a lot of those. They're great, but they're just not the same. Yep. All right, so what do we have going on? On this podcast, we have talked to companies that make mills. We've talked to zirconia manufacturers. And we even talked to a company that mills solid gold. But this week, we talked to the true unsung heroes of our workflow. The Burrs! The Burrs. These tiny yet important parts are the moving pieces that allow us to do what so many of us do every day. And this week... Barb and I got to talk to Greg Everett and Nick Alange from Sierra Dental Tools. Greg and Nick come into the burr business with a lot of lab experience, and it's this experience that sets them apart from your normal vendor. They talk about how working with so many labs, with so many different mills, and all the different issues they run into, and how they're able to help. They also talk about how they can produce a burr that gets a lot more life than your average burr. And let me tell you, if you don't know how they get diamonds on a burr the correct way, then your mind is about to be blown, because mine was. So join us as we chat with Greg Everett and Nick Alange from Sierra Dental Tools. Your mind was about to be blown. (laughs) My mind was blown! I know, but that was just, that just cracked me up. All right. (laughs) Dental Services Group is proud to support the National Board of Certification in Dental Technology and proudly promote certification for dental technicians throughout their national network of laboratories. The CDT designation sets certified dental technicians apart from others in the field demonstrating a mastery of knowledge and applied skills in the art of dentistry. Certification also raises the standards of dental health through education in all aspects of dental technology. At Dental Services Group, they believe dentistry plays a significant role in the healthcare ecosystem and is committed to providing solutions to benefit the overall health and well-being of the patient. 
Visit NBCCERT to learn more about becoming a CDT. And dentalservices.net to learn more about how DSG supports the dental community. And they support our podcast. So thank you, DSG. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. You guys have any other questions or anything? No, no, we're cool for an organic conversation. Elvis, you know what you're doing, so we'll just follow your lead. F-ing fools, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys ready? Let's do it. Yep. Cool. Yeah. We're happy to have on the podcast today the two gentlemen from the Burr Company, Sierra Dental Tool. We have Nick Alange and Greg Everett. How are you guys? Doing well. Thanks for having us. Doing awesome. Yeah, appreciate it. Nice. I love the fact that we're talking to two guys that supplies burrs because we all use hundreds of them in our labs. And I really, I take them for granted. I'm going to be honest. It's just, they go bad. I slap a new one in. We use it. I want to get the whole story behind the burrs. But first, I want to know how you guys came into the industry and how you started making burrs. One does not learn this in college, I take it. True. (laughs) Oh, you're insightful. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, I'll be happy to run through background. Um, yeah, I guess I'll jump on that and then Nick, you can follow me. So I grew up in the lab, basically. I, I came out of high school. My girlfriend, now wife at the time, was a driver at one of the dental labs around town. And uh, I ended up working at the lab, sweeping floors. And over the course of 10 years, I grew from being completely green to uh, running a milling center. Uh, where we had seven milling machines, uh, had six, seven people under me. We're doing like 200 units a day sometimes. And um, along the way, uh, I got to learn under some really, really talented technicians and had a lot of good people around me. Uh, And I broke everything and learned (laughs) learned the hard way uh, on how to break and fix things. And that basically, uh, you know, this is the short version I could yammer for 20 minutes, but that positioned me uh, well to uh, to move into the role here at Sierra, where I was brought on to help run operations and also bring the lab uh, mentality to the company because I've been there, done that, and we can support the laboratory better at this point. So um, now we're three years into it, and I love it. We're making burrs and, and helping people every day. And, and we recently brought Nick in. He's uh, He just joined our team in March, right, Nick? Yeah, right at the beginning of all the excitement. Wow. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Nick's an excellent, excellent addition to our team. Uh, he's more talented than I am in a lot, in a lot of ways. So, uh, Nick, go ahead and give, give a little bit of your background. He's been in a lot longer than I have, so go ahead, Nick. Yeah, so I actually grew up in the lab business, considering my, both my uncles and my father and all of his friends had a dental lab out of one of their houses. So I was always dropped off there as a little kid and picked up. And then my father became a manager of a Kino Star Dental Lab in Tucson. Mm -hmm. They were a large production lab. It was the largest in Southern Arizona at the time. So he managed it. I think he had about 30 or 40 employees. Yeah. That ended up closing down and he started his own lab again in his garage where I had moved back from California and helped him start from ground up. And we did you know, average 65 units a week for two people, just PFMs. And then by about 2006, we had got it up to over 95 units a week. And it was done through mainly like lean manufacturing. One day was mm-hmm. waxing and casting. The second day was divesting, opaquing and build up porcelain. Thursday was build up porcelain and glazing. And Friday was pretty much glazing and doing all the billing for the following week. And I did all the model work through there. So it was kind of neat to learn every step with your father. And then he would pimp me out to work with my uncle and a couple <laughs> of friends because I knew how to foil. My dad taught me, if you don't have time to do it right, you definitely don't have time to do it over. And I've said that for years. So I've learned to spend the time to do it correctly or learn how to do it because like you all know, if you you know send a crown out, that's not going to fit. You're not making any money on the second round about it. It was the problem. Oh, absolutely. And then I met my now wife, and she moved me to California in 2007. And I was destined. I didn't want to be in the dental lab anymore. I wanted to do something different. And she got into a motorcycle accident. So I had to find a job that would actually pay. So I picked up a job at Opus One Dental Lab and learned Mm. the boutique side of the the industry. Yuri over there got me Koi certified on 
their panadent articulators and then went through the whole gamut of articulators because he wanted me in the model room because he, he saw that I had the skill to just do the model work correctly the first time. And then quickly sat in the Sarek chair of designing and getting that mill up and running in 2007. And we were doing about 30 units a day with that little machine. Where the change events happened is I got injured in Whistler, Canada, mountain biking, and I didn't have the use of my hands anymore. So I met a gentleman from Teledium, mean, he hired me on as a technical support guy, mm-hmm. got help with the sales team. So I had to learn like the whole back end of like how sales works with the dental industry or how investments being made, stone. We actually got into manufacturing zirconia and I was the poor little guy measuring out the zirconia powder, putting in a press and then gluing a mandrel on it to go into the serif machines. Really? Wow. Yeah, I quickly found out during all that process, we needed to have a milling center to test our own products because we were selling a lot of zirconia that we didn't know if it had the right Z code or I code on it to oh. make sure that it was right. So it was one of those like, Greg said, you break it and fix it and figure it out. And that's what we did a lot. Yeah. Yeah, in 2010, we got into selling Roland's with uh, Delcam, which was one of the only providers with it. Mm-hmm. And then I picked up three shape scanners and I was the third three shape certified person in the United States to train people. And that's where I fell in love with the helping people. I felt I, I picked up a better appreciation for the industry when I could teach people and watch them grow rather than just making teeth all the time. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to travel around the U S training people and sitting in all these labs and seeing the variety of how we all make crowns or all make restorations, but everybody does it a little different. Everybody mm-hmm. uses a different sure. hand piece. Everybody uses a different grinding tool. And you just sit and talk to a technician for hours and you get to really like feel with them. And, and a lot of these guys, as you know, when they're sitting and making teeth, they either want to listen to music or they want to talk. Or hopefully listen to podcasts. I was yeah, going to say, exactly. yeah. <laughs> I, I know a good dental podcast. <laughs> Um, and then that what's got me into the R and D, which is like learning how I tried to make implant abutments on a big Haas machine, kind of like uh, oh sure, yeah. Brian Lowe was doing, and we were trying to do it without their help. So, you know, when you learn or teach yourself something, you have a really appreciation for somebody who figures it out correctly, rather than <laughs> wasting a ton of time. And that's where my son was born in 2013, and I took a sabbatical from traveling, and I joined mm-hmm. a Pacific Dental Group with Savon one of my really good buddies and we hammered out a ton of cases and I realized I was not enjoying sitting there designing cases all day long. I, I needed the human element and helping people out. Yeah. So I didn't work with them too long and I had an opportunity to work with Rob and Bob and Tom Hagen over at cap. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I worked with them in the sales department because I thought like, Hey, I'm really good at talking and I have these ideas because I've sat in all these labs that works the best. The problem is I'm not a closer. So I got moved <laughs> to the support team and that's where I felt I was really, really good at. So I took a role with Ryan Knight over there and I was the quote unquote distance learning tech support guy, meaning that I was the first and only remote guy that they had at the time. Oh, okay. I see that distance. Yeah. You didn't go to places to help out. Yeah. I was in California and the company was out of Boston. So I would take all the afternoon phone calls for support. Yep. And you know, most people wait for the end of the day for their big cases to be done because they need to get production done. So right at like four o'clock, I'd have the East Coast guys calling up and asking for help on nesting their full all on four cases. Mm -hmm. So I got pretty proficient with cam software as well. And that was with Sim Systems and Millbox at the time at the very end. And then that's when Henry Schein purchased Cap, I believe was 2017. And it was really, it changed a little bit for us because we didn't have the weekly meetings that we were used to. I didn't feel I was part of the same entity anymore. And a bunch of people yeah. were moving. And I had a really good job opportunity to work with Hyperdent. And I felt that was a good way for me to gain more knowledge in this industry because I know ExoCAD a little bit. I know 3Shape really well. I know Armin Gerbach software pretty well. I have Delcam experience, Millbox experience. Hyperdent would just give me an all around blanket to work with tools again because I worked with. Mike and Carrie at Steer Tools back in 2010, mm-hmm. testing out tons of tools for them in different machines because we sold VHF, Roland, and Haas Mill tools. So yeah, I got, I got to try out a lot of stuff. And since we were manufacturing Draconia, we could just throw it out the window if it didn't work. 
So I got to spend a lot of other people's money for my education when it came to this. And then I came to my role as an end with Hyperdent because I wanted, they had a lot of end users that didn't have people for support. So Mm -hmm. I was able to find distributors that best suited those particular clients. And then I didn't have a role anymore there. So Greg and I had been talking and it would seem to be a perfect fit with all of my support knowledge and, you know, contacts across the industry to be a perfect fit for Greg himself. I mean, we think very similar, but his talents are really well in certain things and I'm really talented in other stuff. So it's kind of the yin and yang, I feel, for Sierra. Yeah. That's about me in a nutshell. (laughs) You've been around, Nick. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting, you know, you talk to anybody in this industry and everybody's got a journey, you know. Oh, sure. But so many people didn't start, you know, didn't intend on being in this industry, but yeah, you get in and then you fall in love with it and it's, it's such a small industry and it's you know everybody knows each other and wants to help each other. It's unique. Um and, and personally, you know, well, I'm very passionate for it. Nick's clearly very passionate for it. And when I came on with Sierra, one of the main reasons I wanted to work for Sierra is because the core principle behind the company is to help the industry. And we've, we've been there from day one. And so it, it all fits very well with, you know, my, my philosophy. And then we had the opportunity to bring Nick in and it's like, I've known Nick for what, 10, 12 years now, Nick. Yeah. It's like, oh man, he's, he's perfect. We got it. We got to grab him. So, sure. uh, so now, now here we are and, and like, Nick, you were telling me you had like eight people reaching out to you this morning about random questions. And, you know, we, we don't say no to people. We, we want to help uh, labs work more efficiently and make sure they're getting good use out of not only their tools, but like their materials and getting the best best surface finishes on their, their milling machines, you know, all of the above. It's a blast. It really is. Every, every day, it's very enjoyable. Yeah, and that says a lot about any company in our industry because we are so passionate about it. We need companies that are more than just, this is the product I sell, and I can only tell you about that one product. We need those companies to be able to say, this is the product we provide, and this is how it can support you. And it sounds like you guys really got a good team together to do that. Exactly, because you know most of the end users that reach out to us, they'll say, okay, here's the symptom of what I'm experiencing. I think my milling tool is causing it. But... We have the support structure in place where we can we can look at the entire process and be like, well, did you think about your CAD setting? What's your margin offset set at? Oh, well, I'm trying to mill it at five microns. Well, maybe that's why you're chipping. Let's take a look at this and get you to not chip mark. Yeah. Those are the calls, man. When we end up with, uh, with a good result for a lab, it's so satisfying when you go, oh, we're chipping 30% of our margins and fixing it with ceramic and we're... You know, my high paid ceramist is spending all this time fixing margins and we clear that up for a lab. It's the best. Like uh, me me and Nick probably have 50 different stories about how that's happened. Sure. Just around margins. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so there's so many different mills. Have you had to do research on every single mill out there so that you can do that? Absolutely. So we took kind of a yeah. an organic progression through the industry. The The company was started in 2007. We were the first tooling company to bring a diamond tool into the industry. And as an OEM, as a business model, if you're putting a machine out there, you want the consumable sales, Right. And so when we we brought that diamond tool into the market, we disrupted that business model. And because we suddenly for a tool that costs three times as much, but it lasts 10 times as long. And so the value was very clear. And what that resulted in was basically hand over fist growth. We made some key partnerships early on, specifically with the team at Henry Schein and grew the brand like a rocket ship hand over fist over the first several years. And now you look at it today, we're the premium supplier of, of good quality tools that are supported. And as we go, so we, I'll back up a little bit. We started on the lava machine, the uh, 3M lava, if anybody remembers. Oh, that. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, Everybody one, has <laughs> that one was a bread and butter machine. We were supplying uh, tooling into the big milling centers like Issaquah. They were a very early adapter. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. We changed things over there with the diamond tool. So before you guys, there was no diamond in a mill? Nope. That is strange to me. I, I had no idea. I thought it was always a thing. Yeah, we're. Uh, that's kind of a little known thing about Sierra is that diamond tools or diamond coated tools 
have been in industry, specifically like aerospace sort of niche in industry. Yeah. You know, since the 80s, right? It's been around. Yeah. And nobody had seen the opportunity in this industry. And that's where I have to credit the founder, Mike Wire. He's uh, him and Carrie Langer early on saw that, hey, we can adapt this technology, develop specific geometries for these dental milling machines and really help the industry. Yeah. That was the beginning of the Sierra project, right? You know, it started off small and it just kept, kept growing organically. And to answer Barb's initial question, you know, we start with one machine and then, hey, look, we're getting a lot of demand here on this machine. Let's develop this machine. And so we have an iterative process. And nowadays we have tooling for nearly every machine that's on the market, anything that's got a significant market share. Mm-hmm. And we're constantly looking at the new up and comers. So if machines that are becoming more and more popular, you know, we start off with, hey, now I'm getting two phone calls a week on this mill and people want tooling. All right, I'll develop, I'll find a beta test lab who's got the equipment, we'll work with them very closely, develop the geometries, make sure everything works right, and then we'll scale it up from there. And so we're we're constantly looking for ways to make sure nobody's missing out. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So on all of your tools, so are they interchangeable with different mills or do you have like a different tool for every mill or, or a couple different tools for some mills? What, what is that? What is your stock like? Man, literally everything is different. <laughs> of yeah. course. Yeah. It's dentistry. <laughs> because you go back to the perspective of the OEM again. Yeah. I want the consumables or I want my distributor to have the, the consumable or however that works. Right. And so it's in the machine manufacturer's kind of best interest to develop a unique shape for their tool. They don't want you to be able to put a rolling tool in a VHF machine. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much nuance, not even down to the machine, but down to the machine sub model. Like take a look at like VHF, for instance, there's two different kinds of tooling in VHF. Some of them are 35 millimeter length. Some of them are 40 millimeter length. And so it, it really gets granular. And so To develop a toolkit for a new solution, it's pretty involved, Mm -hmm. but we just kind of take it step by step and go from there. And then on the other side, it has to be validated in the CAM software. That's one of the things that our competitors in in the field really lack, Mm -hmm. meaning that I buy a tool from, you know, Bob, whoever Bob is. Yeah. I don't know what I got. I don't know if it's been tested. Is it proven? Does it match the profiles that are in my software? Am I going to break it? All those things are unknowns. But when you get a Sierra tool, all of that's already been done for you. Um, and so we, we, always, we always go through and do all that. We're never putting anything on the market that hasn't been thoroughly vetted. That's one of the differences between, between us because we're focused specifically on dental. Mm-hmm. That's one of my spiel points. I'm, not, I'm trying to make this a salesy thing. We're, we're trying to yeah, I but, get it. But uh, I'm proud of that, you know, so it, it's important to mention. So, Nick, what do you do? Do you visit labs or do you, are you R&D or what, what is your job like now? Well, currently I'm trying to build our brand through social media to be aware that, you know, we exist and we're not just a tooling company. We manufacture tools that are, the, I think, the best because I've used them and I've used a lot of other tools. So I feel comfortable putting my name on it when I'm calling somebody or doing support because I've used these tools and I've used other ones. And these are the ones that seem to come out awesome. The big thing when it comes to my role right now is, you know, I'm looking at global distributors outside the United States Mm. because I would like to see us have a market share globally because, you know, the U.S. is wonderful. We work very closely with a lot of end users. And I think that, you know, I want to quote unquote travel the world as well. But, you know, there's other cultures that run milling machines that they're not using our tools and I'll find them on Facebook or they'll find me on Facebook and ask me a ton of questions. And it's like, wow, okay, well, it's probably the tool because they'll send us photos and you can see the premature wear on a tool because the zirconia they're using might be a little bit harder than the zirconia that was put into the software. So the we'll log in, either Greg or myself, depending on what software they have and adjust their strategies according to the tools they're running and the zirconia they're using or PMMA because there's different varieties of that and also Trilore and Crystal Ultra. Mm-hmm. These are some of the things where both Greg and I have worked in the trenches per se, 
And we've seen a lot of failures over the years. And that's mainly where we learn from the mistakes is it's not just read out of a manual. I can look at a crown and tell you with about 80% accuracy what's causing that surface texture or the lines in them or chip in a particular margin region. Why are my contacts like <laughs> Yeah. And that's kind of the advantage of our team is we've been sitting at the bench making crowns day in and day out for many years. We're going to use that experience and move forward. Um, the advantage I have over some other people is I probably talk to about 30 different lab personnel across the United States daily just to keep the relationship going and finding out like, hey, have you heard of any new materials? Oh my gosh, what mill are you considering buying? I do a lot of like under the table consulting because people call and say, oh, I know you've touched 14 different mills over the years. Which one works best for this application? And then you have to like, kind of reverse them or ask them other questions on what do you want to do with it? How many do you want to do? What's your budget? Do you want to use this mill for more than one application? Do you want to match it with a printer? Because there's some things that you want for both sides. It's not just one mill is the best. Every mill out there has its little niche that works great. So Hmm. I do a lot of evaluations on that. I don't get to travel as much just because of COVID. Sure. FaceTime, Zoom is amazing to communicate and walk around people's labs. And you can sit, I mean, you guys probably have done this as well. You can watch somebody make, you know, finish a restoration and they're changing the handpiece tools 20 times. Oh, yeah. That's not a waste of time. How about you get the guy three handpieces with three separate, you know, grinding in there and he just grabs the colored one that he needs and that shrinks the the finishing time. Other things are making sure that the cases are not like running back and forth through labs, you know, having it go around the lab or through the lab with some methodical thought on these. These are some things that lab guys that just build up the lab and they start filling it with employees may not have the oversight or the bigger picture that software that tracks the cases through your business is extremely important compared to just lab pans that are color coded. Yeah, There's a lot of different elements to it that make my job so entertaining because when I get a phone call, I don't know what's coming my way. It's the excitement of, do I know the person? If not, is there a language barrier that I need to overcome? And then the terminology that they're used to using, how do I retrofit what I know what they're talking about? Because it happens a lot of times when people call in like, oh, my mill's broken. Well, what's wrong with it? It's not working. Yep. What <laughs> is turning on? Yeah, it, it's, it's blue. Okay, what mill do you have? <laughs> And then you end up like finding the whole solution that, oh, the power supply that he had put on, it faulted out. And it's only getting enough power to turn on the light and not enough amperage to actually run the mill. Like there's wow. just weird things that end up happening on phone calls, which are a lot of fun for my side. And I still get to work with like, I'll go out to Savon's lab and I'll make some crowns, you know, or I'll team viewer in or he'll send me cases. So I still feel like I can stay on top of the game because software changes, materials change. So we have to adapt our tooling to those new applications as well. Because every couple of weeks or every couple of months, Millbox gets updated, Hyperdent gets updated, all these things get updated and we're like, oh, what did they change? So I have to be in conversations with those guys on a regular basis or Greg does to know what updates are having, to make sure that they're using the right tool strategy for the material they're choosing. And we provide those feeds and speeds usually because Greg has mainly done the testing at his facility. That's a good segue. I'll jump in there. So one one of the things we do also, in addition to like what Nick's doing on, you know, helping labs with applications and efficiency, which if you need to sum up what Nick's doing on a daily day basis, that's what it is. We also work on the back end. So we're feeding and helping design those new strategies and making those updates and, uh, and helping on the software side. You know, we've got excellent relationships with the camp software providers and we come up with solutions together. It's kind of a blast because you know the the CAM software and the tool are very intimately related, and it's important that those entities are talking. Mm-hmm. Anytime one of those questions comes up or a development project comes up, uh, we we are on it um, and, and we support it fully. And you know, Nick's involved more on the Hyperdent side. I'm involved more on the Millbox side. You know, there's some other players out there, but those are the main ones in our uh, market. Now, OEMs on the other hand, well, I just bother them and I tell them they, they need to let us help them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we walk a tight line because 
companies that are like VHF that sell their mill and their tools, they don't make a whole lot of money on the mill itself sale. They're making their money on the consumables, which are tools. And they estimate mm-hmm. the tool to run X amount of hours. And here we are on our you know beautiful horse riding in saying we can triple that amount of time on that tool for about the same cost. The lab owners jump on it. The distributors, they get a little afraid. Because yeah, you sure. know they're losing a market share that they're estimating that for every disc of zirconia or every three two discs, let's say they're going to know that they're going to go through a set of tools where yeah. we average about ten discs. You know that's a big difference when it comes to pricing and and pricing out what the crown actually costs in the lab. I don't know too many lab owners that know the exact cost for every employee that touched it for the stone that was used. The breakdown of everything to know what that crown truly costs to go out the door. I've only come across maybe 10 people out of three or 400 that I've spoke to that actually know yeah. that item down to a penny. They have an estimate on what the zirconia costs mm-hmm. and break that down by 18 and then tooling, break that out by 700 units. You know, they have that side, but they don't actually break it down to what does it cost to do a remake in-house? Who's paying for it or what departments that's coming out of? Mm-hmm. You know, I've done it two or three times for a couple of labs. It's very intense because salary gets adjusted or their piece rate employees, you know, the driver had a yeah. car accident, the insurance went up, like all these things come into this equation when you're trying to break down what it actually costs to produce a crowd and what the lab should be pricing the doctors for in their region. Because California is so cheap to making crowns compared to the Midwest, which is, I've seen across the border much better pricing for the crowns, I believe, to keep labs open than what we see here in California. Because at Glidewell, doing that $79 zirconia crown that hinders sure. a lot of my friends. It's the race to the bottom. That's a key thing the lab owners talk about. You know, it's always on everybody's mind. And, you know, the way that you can stay relevant and competitive as a lab is mm-hmm. know your applications, know down to the penny what all your cost structures are, and really manage the operational side of the business really tightly. You can see that this kind of grows from tooling. <laughs> you know, we're, uh, we don't really talk about tooling. Tooling's only kind of part of it, but once you get into the, the physical workflows and the applications and then even business consulting and that sort of thing on lab side. You know, we, we really want everybody to be competitive and, and relevant and sustainable, you know, because again, small industry, it's it's shrinking, you know, it's yeah. consolidation. I mean, I don't know about you, Elvis and, and Barb, but my thought process is, is that we're losing labs every year. And that's what gives our industry character is that small to mid-sized laboratory who gives that personal experience and it ends up helping the patient. The patient's not getting a cookie cutter mass produced crown. They're getting something that was built with love and care. That's what my vision for the industry is to continue doing that. I don't want to see that evaporate. Most people agree with me. Yeah. Unless you're in charge of one of those big corporate outfits, but hey, <laughs> it's a different thing. So when labs call you and they tell you about their mill and what kind of tools they need, when you talk about beta testing with labs, do you give a recommendation based on what you know in the research that you have, how many crowns they can fabricate with the tools in the mill or what the average is or what it should be? Yeah. So that question comes up a lot. And yeah. unfortunately, it's not a science. Uh, I'd love it to be a science, but every laboratory is different. It can come down to what kind of table do you have the machine on? The thing about that is wow. it's very do you have a vibration issue because it's not, you have your mill on a card table? That'll affect tool life. And so that conversation is basically okay, help me understand the environment. Let's talk about maintenance procedures, age of the machine, what specific mm. zirconia you're using because there's a lot of variants in the market, especially now. And then we can always give you a ballpark figure on what you can expect. Okay. Now, generally on our, on our marketing, we like to underestimate because I'd rather over deliver than under deliver. Oh, sure. You know, that's kind of, that's kind of the way that we look at it. And typically, you know, if a laboratory is not getting the results, we have such a high level of quality control in place that it's very rare that the tool causes a problem. We're not infallible, of course, because it's humans, but Usually we'll, we'll jump on and identify an issue and clear anything up. And that's why it's good that we have knowledge of the entire workflow because everything 
boils down to that tool making contact with the restoration. Everything feeds into that funnel. And if, if it's not supported in one way or the other, you, you can get issues at the, uh, out the out- output. So Barb, to answer your question, yes, we can give you guys estimates on that, but it's kind of like on a one-on-one basis. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I always suggest, and this might be a good takeaway for people listening to this, who wants to chip a margin? Nobody. Nobody wants to chip a margin. Nope. <laughs> Get your process in place and then run it through, track your metrics. So I'm not changing anything. I'm not changing the zirconia, my maintenance procedure, the mill. I'm just going to run it through and I'm going to count how many units I get until I get a pattern of chipping. Not one chip, but a pattern like three, four. That's the Mm -hmm. chip point of Mm -hmm. your setup. Calculate chip point, run that three times, average that number, back it off by 10%, and then set that where you change your tools. You will never chip a margin again if you, if you do that. Interesting. But the only way that works is that you're very diligent on the process. You know, it's 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 like anything else. You change one variable, the process changes as a whole. You swap material to a different material, you got to run through that testing procedure again. Yeah. And and you know, like like Nick said, no, normally labs aren't really that nerdy about metrics. <laughs> you know, they just want it to work. Yep. And if it's really not working, then they complain. But I want everything to be running at peak efficiency. So that's how I look at it. I look at it like pragmatically, you know. Yeah, I encourage people to look at metrics and boil down on, on the details. It, it makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Let me interject yeah. real quick there. So metrics is all we want people to do. And it's not that difficult. Have a little sheet next to the mill and tally up the units that are going in the mill at a time. Break that down per day. And then when you have to change tools, count out how many units those tools made it through. And that also keeps track of like remakes and all the other stuff that's going on in the lab. Because you could circle the one being like, oh, this is a remade crown. Then you can look from a distance like, oh, we had six remakes. What was the reason that we had those? And then you can boil it down. Was the design incorrect? Meaning that the occlusion wasn't closed or the contacts were open. Cases these days, people are doing model lists. And they don't get the feedback until it gets ready to seat in the patient's mouth. Sure. And then yeah. it comes back for a remake. It's really nice to know and tally what caused the remake when it happened. Is it a setting in the scanner? Is it a setting in the design software? Is it a, a mill setting because the tool over milled an area that you went to? Did you have an undercut that you didn't remove? Yeah. There's just so many things that over the years, I mean, both Elvis and Barb, you guys have been in the industry long enough. You've seen a lot of mistakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you learn from them. And that's what we're hoping to help people that Greg and I have had so many mistakes in life. Let's try to like save some money for the labs and maybe they won't make the same mistake. And by giving them a little bit of education on preparing for chipping per se or miss mills or even just like losing a case in the lab. We've all been through it. I mean, I know I've spent at least six weeks of my life looking for implant screws. Um, (laughs) (laughs) That one just drives me nuts. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, these are little things like, hey, instead of spending a lot of time, why don't you just have a plethora of those screws lined up so you don't waste that time? Yet, a lot of lab guys won't do that. You know, it's a $25 or $50 screw. They feel they're going to spend time looking for it where you find it, you pull another one out of the package and move on. That's an example of work smarter, not harder scenario right yeah that's my little two cents i wanted to throw in there yeah i'm curious on how you guys make burrs to be as you say what 10 times better oh the secret sauce oh, yeah. yeah i mean what <laughs> difference is there i'm a layman when it comes to these burrs i know carbite and i know diamond but that's about it lay it down how are burrs kind of made how do you get diamond to coat to a burr, and how do you do it better? Do we have three hours all this? Because I'll, I'll... <laughs> no, no. Give me the ten minute version, because that's my intention span. Go. <laughs> <laughs> well, we make the tools the same way any milling tool is made for industry. Uh huh. The tool itself is made out of tungsten carbide, which is an industrial tooling material. Um, which, interestingly enough, is very similar to zirconia. It's a composite material. It's not a metal. Interesting. It's actually, if you go on Wikipedia and look at how it's made, which, uh, you know, if you're nerdy like me, 
You might. Um, I get it. There, it's it's a pressed composite material that is then sintered exactly like zirconia is. So it's shaped. Yeah, sure. Now, once it's in its sintered shape, it is extremely hard. It's almost as hard as diamond. It's it's really up there on the scale. And so that's what makes it a good tool. Because when you want to cut something, the thing you're cutting it with has to be harder than the thing you're cutting. That's like the, the rule. Makes right? sense. So the harder the cutting tool, the better it works. The better it wears, everything everything's better the harder the cutting tool. You know, mostly if you go into a machine shop, you'll see them using carbide tooling. You know, cutting aluminum, steel, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, the way they're made, they start off as a blank. We have equipment that is uh, it's essentially a CNC grinder. And so it uses a special profile diamond grinding wheel at a real high speed, a lot of coolant. And we grind the shape into the, into the tungsten carbide. That's the simplest way of putting it. And so how do you make a good tool? That's something I can't like give away in detail, but basically I get it. Yeah. High points are material input. There's so many grades of tungsten carbide coding and geometries. So the geometry, the shape of the tool the relief grinds, everything makes a huge difference in the performance of the tool. And so when you go out and you buy a standard brown bag sort of tool for dental, yeah. the vast majority of them, the geometries are not specifically designed for dental. They're borrowed from other industries because as a tool manufacturer, you're not going to go through the R&D and develop this geometry if you can just pull it off the shelf. And so... That's the decision that many of the suppliers, manufacturers have made, and that's what you get. And so when we look at the problem, you boil it down to its basic parts, and you develop the solution for the application. And so all of our geometries are for, they're designed to work well in low-powered dental equipment Mm -hmm. and work well in dental materials. That's a huge part of it. And then the other part of it, you asked about diamond. Yeah. How do you make a tungsten carbide tool harder? You diamond coat it. How do you make it more resilient to abrasion from ceramics? You diamond coat it. And so it's a perfect fit for milling zirconia. And diamond coating is a beast. It's a science and it's it's more involved than stacking ceramics. There are more nuances to it than making a crown. And not everybody can do it right. There are only a couple of outfits really who do know how to do it right. Yeah. On top of that, doing it right on a micro tool is a whole nother thing. Yeah. Because you're coating such a small part, there are thermal characteristics, there's all kinds of things that come into play in order to do a good job. So we do all of our coating in-house. We are able to quality control, small batch everything, and make sure that we're putting in premium coating. I have to mention how the coating works. Yeah. Yeah, because it's super neat, at least it is to me. I love this stuff. I'm nerding out right now, so please continue. (laughs) <laughs> you're always nerdy now i'm a visual guy i wish we had something to look at like i know how it's done but it's so much more fun to show it i'll draw a picture with words guys <laughs> please it's a podcast you can do it yeah, yeah. <laughs> got to in the mind let's go i'll try my best key takeaway here is if it says diamond tool it's it's like saying pfn crown you have no idea what it is unless you know about the process and what went into it Sure. And so the process that we utilize is called CVD. Mm-hmm. And CVD stands for chemical vapor deposition. And layman's way of looking at it, basically the tools are put in a reactor. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie. Mm-hmm. Inside that reactor, it's drawn down to a, a real high level of vacuum. And then we inject methane gas and superheat it. That blows the methane molecule apart, CH4 into individual carbon atoms. And then we control the environment in that chamber with the tools inside and the carbon atoms actually precipitate down onto the tool and they grow as a diamond. And so if if in like middle school- What? Yeah, so so you remember those little projects you could get like little science projects and you grow a crystal? It's a- Oh yeah, rock candy, sure, yeah. yeah. Rock candy, wow. Growing diamond directly onto the tool. No kidding. Under a scanning electron microscope, it looks like diamond. They're little tiny crystals. And it's just done at a molecular scale. So when you're holding the tool in your hand, it looks like a black coating. Mm-hmm. And that's really where lesser manufacturers kind of pull one over is because you can throw a cheap coating on a tool. It kind of looks the same, but it isn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So yeah, it's actually a growth process. And 
there's so many variables that go into it that decide how big the crystals are, how the coating adheres to the tungsten, all this stuff. It's, it's super neat. How do you control it so it's evenly on the burr? So it's all done with fixturing and how it's oriented in the chamber. So we have fixturing that basically works like a solar system. If you could think of it like that, it's planetary. So it, works, yeah. it rotates everything as it's, as it's coating. Oh, and I see. Yeah. It gets a very even coating, which is critical, by the way. I imagine. Yeah. If it's not even, the performance of the device goes out the window. So how long does this process take to do like one burr? Is it like seconds or is it like... Nope, it's like six, eight hours for one back. For one burr? One back. Yep. It's an elongated sort of process. And so, you know, that's why... Burrs are expensive. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> well, that's actually not where I was headed. That's that, that's why our burrs are good. Because as a manufacturer, you know, if somebody just came off the street and started wanted to start a burr manufacturing company, they might get to the place where they can make a carbide tool. Mm-hmm. But there's a whole other level to being able to do the coating in-house. No kidding. Yeah, it's not just the investment of the machine itself. It's also the skill and technique. So oh, yeah. most of the outfits that are out there farm out the coating. And so it's just like in the dental lab, you know, I might outsource my milling and maybe I don't know yeah. if that crown came from China or where the heck the zirconia came from, right? Because you don't own the whole process. It's the same with coating. Most of these coating outfits, your tooling would be thrown in with a bracket or something else that they're coating. And you change the thermal characteristics of that chamber by having something massive next to something that's not massive and your consistency and repeatability is just, it's not existent. And so that's why I mentioned the coding micro tools in and of its own, its own kind of sub science. So sure. It's a lot of fun. I, uh, that is fascinating. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to nerd out. <laughs> yeah. I am never going to call it diamond coated again. I'm calling them diamond grown from now on. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Yeah. We might have to coin that statement. <laughs> Wow. Don't have me explain it. Talk to this guy. <laughs> Diamond Grown by Elvis Dahl. You guys do that all in your facility? Everything's run through there? Yeah. And where is that located? I don't know if you guys already went through that. So we're in California. Okay. And I can't really go deeper than that because we're structured as the dental arm of a very large company. You're classified. Classified. Mm. So awesome. get it. that's as far as I can go with it. Okay. Unless you that's want to cool. tell me and sign an NDA, then we can talk. <laughs> <laughs> anymore i wouldn't understand you so it's yep. fine. <laughs> right 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 um, i just thought you made a burr and then you put some glue on it and you rolled it in diamonds and then it was done no. okay. <laughs> it's something that's interesting the other entity you know if you watch like elon musk and what he's doing with spacex oh yeah yep some of our tools make those parts on those rockets no kidding that's cool so i got i gotta put that out there <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah. Oh, and then you started to jump on something, Elvis. Rolling it in diamond. That's how grinding tools are made. Hmm. So the whole other process so smart. for grinding emacs, that's how those are made. So you have a tool core. It's rolled in a, uh, a mixture of diamond and paste, basically. Mm-hmm. And then it's electroplated. And so awesome. the electroplating actually holds the chunks of diamond to the metal core. So those are the ones that go in are like a hand piece. Uh, yeah. The, so anything that's, so that in industry, you call it an electroplated tool. Yeah. And you're seeing those in labs. So if it's in a hand piece and it's got little pieces of diamonds, it's electroplated. The, the tools that are used in CAD CAM for doing Emax and lithium silicates, those are also electroplated. You know, that's a whole other conversation, but those are basically, they're, they're rolled in diamond and electroplated. And if you were to section one of those, you would have the core, and then you have a very thin coating of, of electroplated nickel alloy that's encompassing the aggregate. You can think of the diamond as aggregate. And so mm-hmm. it holds it to the tool, and as the machine is using the tool, the diamond's doing the cutting. And eventually, mm-hmm. those tools will fail because the diamond will either come out or it'll it'll round over. You know, that kind of thing yeah. out of that when they get when they get dull. Is the material the difference in whether it's electro coated or grown? What did you say? Or grown, Elvis? <laughs> so is it the material that determines that? It's the production process. So okay. we specialize in milling tools. So we're actually mm-hmm. doing a physical cut with a tool that looks like a drill bit. Right, right. Okay. So it's, yep. it's cleaving the material. The other process is a grinding process. So you think about it like grinding. <laughs> grinding, Got it. grinding contact in. 
And so they're different, yeah. different process, different tool, different technology. And it's material driven because you cannot mill glass ceramic. Yeah. It will destroy the tool. We were just talking about trying that this morning, Nick. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. quite entertaining to see it blow up. I've done it a couple times. I bet. Yeah. yeah. Because it, get a I camera bet. on there slow mo, I bet you it's real cool. Yeah. Well, the amount of sparks that come out of this thing are spectacular. That's what's amazing. Yeah. Before it fails, it's utterly amazing because the tungsten grinding into the lithium disilicate. It's a blue glow. It's really amazing. It's not like the orange. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it's like, pop, and everything like just goes away. You spend about 150 bucks on a tool and 40 bucks or 30 bucks on the Emacs, and you got nothing left <laughs> except for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have that back to you tomorrow. Is that cool? Yeah. <laughs> if there were a way to do it, somebody would be doing it. Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, and I really, I really hate this, but we're limited by physics. You know, we could change physics. We could come up with some real creative stuff. But unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is really enjoyable. I love when I get to talk about this sort of stuff at this level. No, I think it's really fascinating. I had no idea that's how it was done. Same here. That's cool. That's why we love this podcast. The same. Yeah. Right on. God forbid I learned something. Uh, <laughs> it's a form of dental, just a different angle from yeah. it. I've sat in lectures on stacking porcelain and finishing Emacs and, you know, looking at the aesthetic side of life for so many years to then get into the actual, like, the production side and going down that from our tools, we could give you a surface texture that looks like a golf ball or something that's as smooth as a bowling ball. You know what I mean? Like, you can have that in the cam and the tools you're using and what you want. Like I worked for um, a guy that he actually wanted the golf ball effects, these little dimples around the crowns because the zirconia back in the day didn't have any vitality to it. And he felt that that added little sparkles to the zirconia. So when he glazed it, it then he would polish it and the crowns came out like they looked unique, but interesting. Uh, yeah. Way prior <laughs> to like the aesthetic zirconia we have now that's multiple shaded. Yeah. It was just a way to get around the aesthetic side of it was putting a surface texture into the material. Hmm. Awesome. That's the cool thing is like you can, if you really drill into it, no pun intended here. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many things you can change to get the result you want as a dental lab. And it's cool. Some dental labs, they want to push a button and get a crown. I totally get that. And then a small percentage of them want to screw with everything. <laughs> yeah. and, and try to try to be their own R&D. That's the camp that I was in. And that's why I'd work 14 hours fixing a machine that I crashed because hmm. trying to push it too far, <laughs> yeah. you know, that sort of thing. But it's really the, you know, learn by breaking approach that I personally live by. You know, I don't know about you guys in your operation, but I would say the vast majority of people don't want to have to develop their own tool paths and, really get real back into it yeah you know but Agree. Uh, and so as far as like what we put out on the market it's kind of we're trying to service the vast number of people create solutions that are conservative and repeatable but then there's the fun stuff you know like milling a full contour in like six minutes on a hops you know and yeah doing nutty stuff like that that's that's what's fun <laughs> yeah sure. it's just starting to come about and a lot of different companies have it Yep, Greg and I worked on this project about a year and a half ago, which we were milling them without a problem. And now they're starting to be sold in these new kits for holding the blocks, different ways of machining it. It's very entertaining because I'm on the old school side of you print something, it's not fully developed, meaning that you have to light cure it. You can see lines in it still. Whereas with yeah. a puck of PMMA or denture material, it's a solidified material. You're not going to get porosity in it. You're not going to have any other issues. We get to see what you're milling right then and there and see their problems. And then you glue the teeth into the sockets. I've just had so many experiences over the last five years working with denture related projects that I feel at the time right now, machining them, you still get the best aesthetic result on the market. Let me ask you, uh, Barb and Elvis, like, what's your take on removables right now? You guys talk to a lot of people. Do you see it? Like, what's your honest opinion of where removables are headed as far as digital production? We talked to somebody, I think, last week that said he was doing um, digital dentures. And I think that they've come a whole heck of a long way. Uh, personally, at our laboratory, we're not doing them yet. Um, we do have several carbon printers and everything to do them, but we don't have the team to be able to help fabricate them. But yeah. I definitely think there's a there's a place for it. 
Elvis? I agree that it's coming. We're not doing them here either, just because for the price that we sell them for in the team that I have, we can do them better and faster. Yeah. Yeah. And until that technology is able to match that, I don't see the point of jumping on board, but I think it's fascinating, and I hope it does become the new normal. Yeah, same here. Yeah, I'm with you guys, too. I prefer to hand-build them just because I've been doing it for years. Or when I try to teach people how to design, it's like, all right, let's try to figure out our midline to start out with this entire case. And the doctor didn't send any of that information that you just have to opposing arches. And it's like, how do I get my pipe lock in here? Like, I have no idea. And that's where I fight, is getting the correct information from the doctors to do cases digitally. Oh, yeah. That's the challenge, right? The interesting thing is, is that uh, in 2005, we were having the same discussion about PFMs. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I think, you know, over the next decade or so, you're going to see it go full digital. But it's a matter of what happens with it and what the cookie cutter sort of production workflow ends up being. Like, we're in the early days right now. which is yeah. interesting. You know, it's something that... You know, we're definitely keeping an eye on, and if we can help from a machining standpoint, we're going to. Sure. If it ends up going mainstream, the printing, that's what happens, you know. But uh, I always enjoy with looking at what's developing and asking people what their thought process is on it. So appreciate that. Yeah. I think a lot of it is being held up until we get intraoral, fully edentulous scanning. That's I agree. Oh, yeah. Perfected. Absolutely. I mean, you can uh, half do it, but... Eh, you know, until it becomes the standard, then the product will have to follow suit. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the patient and the doctors will demand it at some point. Yeah. Once it gets there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Once we can educate the doctors, I agree with the Elvis too, is I've taken a lot of phone calls on how do I do this? And I'm like, you're the doctor prescribing it. You tell me how you want it done. <laughs> I, I, I have had to have these stuff. Like, Whatever information you give me, I'm going to do the best I can with what you give me. But if you only give me 20% of what's required for this, I can only polish it so much to get it back to you, if you know what I mean. But that's what we do. We create miracles out of nothing. Oh, yeah. so, <laughs> it's half the fun. It is. <laughs> it is very rewarding to actually meet the patients that you've done the cases for. This is what a lot of the dental technicians I talk to, they forget that we're not arguing with a doctor. We're not fighting this where ultimate goal is to make people healthy and happy through their teeth. Because I have changed so many people's smiles that they'll come up with a smile where I've known them for years and they would always hide. They didn't have the confidence they had once that we redid the issues that they had with their teeth. That's where I get so excited is to know that those are the people I'm truly changing. Not necessarily the CAD cam guy and his tool, but that restoration is given the best quality it can be given. So when the patient is wearing a crown that I was involved in indirectly, it was there on time, it was the right shade, and it fit. That's the forgotten talent that we do here and being a support guy compared to being a dental technician. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Much more than a a tooling company. When we lined up this interview, I was thinking we were just going to be talking about burrs, but you guys really have a beat on the industry. Yep. And it sounds like you guys have a huge passion to help us, and I appreciate that. Me too. Yeah, and we're here for you. Well said. Appreciate it. This hour blew by. Big time. And I don't even think we scratched the surface. No, that's what I said. We have three hours. We can get this done. (laughs) Well, we might have to have a part two down the line. That would be exciting. I'd like to do that. Yeah. Real quick, the website so people can find you. Yeah, so you can look at our tooling offering to sierradentaltool.com. And then if you want to get some free education and information, we've got our blog slash video website. It's called We Team Up, mm-hmm. uh, weteamup-dental.com. Somebody owned the other URL. <laughs> we had the dash dental on it. Yeah, I get it. And if you want to check out, you know, we've done some cool content. We post anything that we're doing, you know, in the industry. It all goes in there as an aggregate. Uh, it's a good resource for people. And there's no paywall or anything. You can just jump in there and look at whatever you want to look at. Sure. And then also, you know, uh, our contact information is on the Sierra site. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to the Sierra team directly, you know, we're always there to help. Hopefully we were good at illustrating that fact. You know, like you said, Elvis, we're not just a tooling company. We're here for the industry. And I really genuinely appreciate the opportunity to get in front of your audience and express that because that's that's kind of the core messaging right now. 
thank you guys very much for that. I, we both appreciate it. Yeah, thank you too. Oh, thanks for coming yep. on. Yeah, thank you guys for having us. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we appreciate it, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks a lot, guys. All right, thank you. All right. Thank you. Enjoy. Take care. Have a good one. Bye. I got some new equipment in the lab last week. Really? What did you get? We thought it was time to expand our 3D printing. So we got a Form Labs Form 3B printer. I remember when we talked to somebody from Form Labs at Lab Day last year. That was when it just came out. Is that why you went with that one? Yeah, and also because it's an advanced desktop 3D printer optimized for biocompatible materials that can handle everything from models to surgical guides, from full dentures to temporary restorations and everything in between. Wow. And let me tell you, starting at $4,999, which was very attractive, it has a larger build plate than our old DLP printer, allowing us to print two to three times more parts in a single build. Wow, that was a mouthful. That definitely sounds like a great upgrade to what you were using before, but let's be honest. How is the support? Because you and I both know that's super important. So the last printer we got, it required a full day of training. Somebody had to come in here. It took a whole day out of production. But with the Form 3B, I, me, Elvis, literally just unpacked the boxes and set it up myself. Come on. I know. We were printing within the hour. Plus, they have a dedicated team of certified dental support specialists who know exactly how to help when you need it. And they have this thing called the Dental Service Plan that includes personalized onboard training, proactive check-ins, which is nice, and the best phone and email support in the industry. Amazing. I am super stoked. I'm going to have to check that out. So, at that price... You could own a fleet of them for the price of one of the other printers out there. How can people learn more about the Four Lab printers, Elvis? Well, I was talking to Ferris at Form Labs last week, and they are getting ready to have a new talk show style announcement real soon about an exciting new product from Form Labs. Head over to bit.ly slash form dash voices or see the link on this episode's show notes to reserve a seat and to learn more about this amazing printer. Well, I'm going to go check it out right now. I'm always looking for the cutting-edge technology. So, Elvis, enjoy the printer. Let me know how it is. I will. Well, we appreciate your support of the podcast, Form Labs. Thank you. So a big thanks to Nick and Greg. We really appreciate a company that knows our industry and takes the time to help and assist labs to be more successful. If you are interested in seeing what they do and what they are doing, check out the links in this episode's show notes. Also check out weteamup-dental.com, where they have been posting videos featuring the dental laboratory industry. Remember, it's not diamond-coated, it's diamond-grown, and that is what blew Elvis's mind. <laughs> I still find it extremely fascinating. Sure and it's grown. I mean, we did this interview weeks ago. And I still talk about it. I find it so interesting. Well, remember, everybody, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Check us out. Leave us a review when you're listening to it. We would definitely appreciate it. All right. That's all we got. Have a good week. Have a good one. Everybody take care. Bye. 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 Beep. We're going to edit that. (laughs)